Well, it's lovely to see you. Um, during these summer months, I did two or three years ago, actually it was 2019, I did a short series as I was preaching over the summer where I, I picked um, a worship song or a hymn and just, and then unpicked it. Um, uh, and kind of looked at it in detail and what it's saying and why some of these songs are good. Um, and I did that for two reasons. One, just to, to make it a bit lighter over the summer. We do try and, um, uh, and tackle scripture in as much depth as we reasonably can. Um, and that's quite hard going for you listening. I'm aware of that. And it's also quite hard going um, doing some of that preparing. So just to kind of make that a little bit lighter over the summer for you and for me, um, I'm going to do that again starting today, if that's all right. Uh, so looking at some of these songs that have shaped the worship of the church over the past few decades, um, I made a mistake last, the first one I did, I think, where I, uh, I assumed that everyone was familiar with the hymn. So I preached about that, and then afterwards several people uh, uh, came and said, never heard that before in my life. And I Really? Um, just as I am without one plea. And there were people that hadn't heard it. Yeah, don't look at me like that. It's one of them sitting next to you. <laughs> I said, just stop being. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're the one I remember. <laughs> and I can't, so you've never been to a Billy Graham convention, obviously. Um, but, um, but so I'm not going to, I did consider redoing one, and I might yet redo one, uh, depending on how the next few weeks go. Because um, some of them, I only did four, I think. Um, but they, uh, they, they were great. But I've had a, two or three more, four or five more, that I want to go into. So today I'm going to uh, do, uh, do one of those. Now, those of you who know me realize that I'm quite picky about the hymns and songs that we, uh, we, use, uh, that we sing and worship with together in church. And why is that? I go, well, I could give you a more spiritual sounding reason, uh, and that is that before printed Bibles were commonly available, before they were cheap and in everyone's home, many hymns, the older songs, were written deliberately to... There's going to be a bit of excitement in there. It's, it's great. Um, many songs were written deliberately to, uh, to convey biblical truth. They were written in that way so that when set to music, it was easy to remember some of the scriptural truths um, uh, and... Uh, uh, and to call them to mind when we do too. Um, and it's still important, even at a time when we we'll probably all have a Bible app on our phones, and yet how often do you kind of, except in house group or whatever, do you just quick, kind of quickly bring it to mind? Or is it that sometimes when you're driving or walking and you're pondering something, and as you do so, a little snippet of a hymn or a song just kind of seizes you? Uh, and you wouldn't necessarily have thought, well, I will, I will go to Scripture and I will look up Psalm 208 um, to, to see what it has to say. <laughs> no, they, they thin out after 150, I've noticed. Um, <laughs> you're looking at me thinking, he really doesn't know there's only 150 Psalms, does he? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, so I think there's still a place for learning these songs. So I think it's still valid and reasonable to go through the songs that we're presented with that we can pick up easily um, from the kind of massive resources that we have for uh, current songs and listen to them and go, hmm, not sure about that one. I don't think I want to. And some of them are so egregious that I just thought there's no way we're singing that. <coughs> um, There's a second reason why uh, you might think I'm picky about these songs, and that's just because I'm a picky person. Uh, I don't like nonsense. And so when some of these songs have nonsense in them, uh, it just, it irritates me. And I find, and I find it hard to worship, and that's sometimes unfair, because you might not. Um, but, and I don't want to necessarily ruin any songs that you like, uh, but I might. So. I'm just going to lay that out there. <clears throat> and if there's something that is misleading or untruthful uh, in a song, then I think we should share that. Sometimes it's just a practical thing. Now, here's a song that you might like called My Lighthouse. You might have sung it. You might like it. It's nonsense. I know. I know lots of people do. But My Lighthouse. 
I will follow you. I'm a lighthouse. I'm not going anywhere. It just makes no sense. But it, it's kind of worse than that because really the My Lighthouse is an attempt to kind of uh, to gild the idea that Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light. He's not confined to a tall building. And a lighthouse doesn't say, come to me. A lighthouse says, don't come to me, there's rocks near here. <laughs> so, so that just winds me up. And if you enjoy worshipping with it, then go for it. And I know we've, we have sung it once or twice in here, and I hope I, well, I, 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 do you know if I have ruined it for you? I'm sorry. I'm not really sure I am sorry. Um, it just, it is what it is. It's a nice jolly tune and we all like that, but let's just go with something that's biblical. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but I'm going to. Pat, what do you think? Are you with me on, not on that song particularly, but not on that song particularly, but just on that. <laughs> so I, I say that because Pat is a, uh, as a songwriter, many years standing and, uh, uh, and, and does have songs. That, uh, there is one song that we used to sing often, but probably less so recently, just because times change. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, so, and I don't think that's necessarily the intention in, in that kind of song that it points away from God at all. I think it's, they're just kind of, uh, there are so many good songs written over so many hundreds of years that a modern songwriter is just a bit stuck because there's so much, you know, oh, I could do this song, couldn't I? So, that says, um, Great is thy faith, and how that's been done. Uh, I could sing a song that, that, you know, so many great songs have been done. Anyway, moving on. I'm just picky, that's, that's the truth of it. Um, sometimes songs are all about us, and you might have heard that kind of comedy version of, uh, uh, of that song, it's all about you, Jesus, and there is a version you can listen to on YouTube that is, it's all about me, Jesus, as if you should do things my way. Um, so uh, do have a listen to that for fun. Um, do you, well, how would you feel about a song where God isn't mentioned at all? Not keen on that? It's just, you know, we wouldn't want to sing songs like that in church. Yeah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Keep going, God isn't mentioned. <laughs> so, I know. Sorry, I was just catching that. <laughs> Sorry, I Gary John's walked in and it's just thought, what's he up? So, so this, I want to look at, it is a great song. And yes, we don't, we know, there are songs that don't mention God that are all about him um, because they pick on one aspect of his, of his nature, which is his grace. And so, um, so we're okay with that. I want to uh, pick on, a, uh, on an old hymn. Um, we've sung uh, quite often. And this time, uh, so the first time when we did Just As I Am Without One Plea, I made the mistake of not singing it in the worship, thinking um, everyone knows it. Um, but today I've kind of covered that one. We sang it. Um, and you're thinking, okay, we sang two old ones, which is it? Um, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Um, great song, um, fairly old, unlike many great hymns, written by a woman. Got to tell you, yes. written by a woman. Yes. Yes. How many of today's songs were written by women? Yeah, the last two were. The last two were. Ada Hartshorn wrote the third one. And, uh, and Charity Lee Bancroft. She had an interesting life. Um, I'm just going to say she had three surnames and leave it at that. And she wasn't married to any of them when she died. Um, so she had an interesting life. God chooses any one of us, doesn't he, to, uh, uh, to serve him and does great things. So... Another interesting thing about some of these songs is how the tune that they are sung to matters. It, not necessarily as a spiritual thing. This, this song was sung initially to, um, to a tune, particularly an old tune uh, called, what did I say? It was called A Sweet Hour of Prayer. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It's lovely. It's a dirge. 
I'm sorry, it's lovely, it's a sweet dirge, but it is just... And this song re never really kind of captured the imagination uh, uh, with that tune. Until in 1997, uh, Vicky Cook uh, penned, the, penned the tune, do you pen a tune? Wrote the tune, whatever. Um, the tune that we sang uh, to today. And that song has been, was captured, it matches it so well, doesn't it? Um, in fact, it matches it so well that the, uh, one of the earliest cover versions done uh, by uh, a band called Shane and Shane. Guess what the lead singers are called? Shane. Mm, and the other one? Shane. Yeah. Um, they didn't ask for copyright because they, they knew the words were old and they just assumed that the tune was an old hymn tune. They just thought, we can do that. So they did it and then had to have a conversation about copyright afterwards because the tune was quite new. Um, because it fits so well, it feels like it's always been there, doesn't it? Um, so uh, this song written in the 1860s um, uh, didn't really kind of capture the church's imagination for over 100 years. Um, Charity Lee Bancroft um, <coughs> um, originally called this hymn Advocate. Uh, she was the child of an Irish minister. She was born in Dublin um, in 1841 and wrote the song in her 20s. Um, and, uh, and we'll come back to the text later, but just the tune that it goes to. Uh, is just so good. And it sometimes throws us when we sing a familiar song to an unfamiliar song. And sometimes that throwing just is really good because it just kind of breaks the familiarity and, and makes us think about it afresh. But let's unpack the song. Here's where we start. Uh, thank you. And Anne's going to put the words up as we have just sung it. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, and whoever lives and pleads for me. And I want to unpack the song, think about whether it's scriptural um, and whether it says anything uh, great. So just in that first line, before the throne of God above, just that first line, what an, econ what an economical use of words. Before the throne of God above. We are, our starting point for this song is that we are before God's throne. And before God's throne implies not sitting at his right hand or his left hand, not as co-heirs with Christ, as the Bible tells us, but at this stage, we are before the throne. We are called to a judge. Imagine getting a call um, in different times to a call by the king or the queen. And so, you know, imagine Queen Elizabeth I summoning you and you get there and she's on a throne. You're gonna assume you're gonna leave there without, without your head. And you probably would. So we come to be judged. Whose throne is it? The God above. It is a mighty heavenly throne. And just, just in that opening line, we can read so much is already packed within it. We are before the throne of the almighty God. And that's our starting position. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and calls us to repentance. And what can we do? How do we argue our case before a holy God? I have a strong, a perfect plea. Well, that's confident. How many people went before Queen Elizabeth I expecting a bit of a beheading? Can you have a bit of a beheading? <laughs> I think it's an all or nothing thing, isn't it? So, just, a, just a nick, just a flesh wound. Um, so you come before, and to be able to say, I've got a strong, a perfect plea. You know, the, the guards are calling you in and saying, come on, Queen wants to see you. She's got a sharp, sharp sword. And you hmm. It's okay, I have a strong, a perfect plea. How will we plead? Should we try to argue our way? Should we explain that we haven't been too bad? We're really not very bad people. And, and we've had quite a lot of difficulties in life. The circumstances have kind of worked against us. And, and our parents didn't really uh, um, help us. They didn't bring us to church. They've let us down and so have our friends. Uh, and, and whatever human pleas we can think of, that's not gonna work. Here we see it plainly written. We have one plea. I have a strong and perfect plea. And there are other songs that use that same kind of language and one of them I've already mentioned, just as I am, without one plea, without one plea, but that thou bids me come to thee. There is no other argument. There is no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. 
So that idea of, I've only got one plea. What is that plea? A great high priest, whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Jesus is our great high priest. His name is love and he ever lives and he pleads for me. In Hebrews chapter 4 we can read, since, we, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in times of need. Our plea is Jesus. We come expecting to face judgment and when we come and our plea is Jesus, we find mercy and grace. Yes, I'm guilty, but Jesus is my plea. He's been punished in my place. So there are some consequences of that simple uh, situation. And if we look at the second half of that first, what are some of those consequences? My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, that lovely line, uh, which is slightly old-fashionedly put, no tongue can bid me thence depart. I did try and think, can we just kind of modernize the language without cha changing it? Mm, any suggestions on that line? It's kind of got a rhyme with heart. Sorry? I wouldn't. <laughs> but, and I'd rather just spend time explaining it to youngsters of today, but it's just old fashioned language. I'll tell you what it means. My name is graven on his hands, not written in pencil, not even in permanent marker. It's graven, it's scratched in, it's engraved, it's cut in. My name is cut into the flesh of the Father, just as the nails pierce the hands of the Son on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 49 verse 16, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. My name is permanently on God's hands. As a reminder, how many of you used to, used to or still do, write on your hand as a, when, you, when you need to remember something? Yeah, yeah still, still people do. Uh, I remember sitting down for breakfast once when one of my sisters was doing her O-levels, gives you an idea of our age, and she sat down for breakfast at home, and as she sat down, her school skirt sort of slid up, and rose up a bit as it does when you're sitting, and there on her leg was written some notes. <laughs> and mum saw. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that changed the morning for her. <clears throat> so, but it's not even in permanent marker. God has his name, has my name, has your name on his hands. So if he ever was to forget, which he won't, he could just go, Paul, yeah, love him. Gary John, mm, excellent. Ariel, fabulous. You know, he sees that. And as that first verse draws to a close, it says, we are engraved on his hands. Our name is written on his heart. And while he in heaven stands, in heaven he stands while, while he's doing that. And how long is that going on for? That's not changing. No tongue can bid me thence depart. Old fashioned, but nobody can tell me to leave my place at God's throne. It is not for my family. It is not for my church leader. It is not for my church doctrine. It's not for politicians or anyone to try and separate me from the love of God. Who knows Romans 8? I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But a first verse. There's a lot in there, isn't there? Just that we've come to be judged. If our plea is Jesus, then mercy and grace are there and God has us not just in his hand, but written there, lest he forget. And so that we can say with confidence that God knows my name. Moving on to the second verse. The second verse is exhausting. You know, you thought verse one was packed with biblical truth. Verse two, um, when Satan tempts me to despair 
and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there that made an end to all my sin. This verse, I think, has pretty much all the gospel packed into just a few lines. I think it's probably the most efficient in terms of um, number of words, kind of summary of the gospel that I've ever heard. It starts with an enemy. We have an enemy. Having just affirmed in the first verse that nothing can separate us from the love of God, Charity Bancroft goes on to say, yeah, but there is one who'll try. There is one who'll try, and this will be something you experience in life. There is an enemy who will try. Satan will try to tempt me to despair, who will point me to my guilt. And he will try and deceive me into forgetting that despair and guilt and shame are done. They are dealt with. So when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, how am I going to handle that? Am I going to go, oh, I know, it's awful. Yeah, I feel so bad. Yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I have done terrible things. Or am I going to look up? Upward I look and see him there. The writer knows that the Bible calls us to draw near to God. And when we do that, draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Look up. God is enthroned in glory. Look up. You can see him there. Look up. He is the one who made an end to all your sin when he reconciled all things to himself through his blood shed on a cross. I think this next line is probably the most powerful line I, for me that in every English hymn I've ever read. I'm not kidding. It's all here. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's a lot packed in here. My saviour is without sin. My saviour died for me. And it's because of that that I, sinful soul that I am, can be counted free. And Charity is picking up a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I am counted free, free from sin, free from guilt, and free to serve the King of Kings. Whenever I... And whenever we sing it and we just come to those two lines, I just my heart says, here it comes. <laughs> because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And if, if somebody asks you, why are you a Christian? And you're thinking, oh, I can't think of all the Bible verses that I ought to think of right now. My mind's gone blank. Um, I, I, I find it hard to explain. Why are you a Christian? Because the sinless saviour died. My sinful soul is counted free. But God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And then if we need to unpack that language, we can do that easily. I am free. Verse 3. This is exhausting. There is so much in this. Verse 3. Uh, it's just an easy little ride of worship and that's it. No, it isn't. There's so much more in this. It seems that she's straining to burst out in praise, but there is more crucial teaching to impart to us first. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. Upward I look, she said in the last verse, and see him there. Upward I look and see him there. And now she cries, behold what does she mean? Simply this, I've looked, now you need to look too. Behold, not only will I see him there, but I see him risen. He once was dead, but now is alive. The writer's theology tutorial would not be complete without reminding us that Jesus is risen. She spoken in the previous verse about him died, about that he had died because the sinless saviour died. Behold him there, the risen lamb. Who is this he? 
He is righteousness. God looks on him and sees this righteousness and chooses to see me just the same. God looks at you and sees you clothed in the righteousness of your son, of his son. Who is this he? He is the great I am. He is one with the Father. He is the King of glory, the King of grace. I love this hymn so much, and yet the next line annoys me. <laughs> There's always like, amazing grace, <laughs> amazing grace, the last verse that John Newton didn't actually write about 10,000 uh, 10, years. There's just, uh, yeah, Paul knows what I'm talking about, eh? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. What's the next line? <laughs> There's no less days. It should be fewer. Uh, it annoys me slightly. I love that song. Here we are. One with himself, I cannot die. I don't know what that means. I was looking into 19th century grammar to see if it's changed. Um, and it hasn't. This, do you know, I think this, it lets the hymn down. That word, of, that word himself. Is charity saying that Jesus is one with himself? That doesn't make any sense. But if she's saying that anyone else is one with Jesus, I think that is what she's saying. I think she's saying she is one with Jesus. We are one with Christ. Then it shouldn't be himself. It's the wrong word. It should just be with him. One with him. I cannot die. But then when you sing it, I know. I know. I know. And so one grammatical slip. I just poetic license with the wrong, incorrect use of the reflexive just annoyed me. But one grammatical slip, it can't detract really from a masterclass in singable theology. So it irritates me. And when I sing it, I just, I just, I've sung it until I was unpacking this the other day. I say, I just, I don't quite know what that means, but it's been such a great hymn. We're near the end. I'm just going to keep singing. One with him. I, yeah. One with him, I can live near. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear you, sorry. I didn't hear you, sorry. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm okay. I'm just saying that, you know. Um, well, anyway, it is such a great song. There's just a little grammatical, there's a little grammatical owie in there. One with him. I am one with Jesus. I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. Colossians chapter 3 gives us the truth. Our lives are hid with Christ. For you died, he writes, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. With Christ, my Savior and my God. And that rounds it up. Just fabulous.